Hi, and welcome to the Agency Bud podcast. Tap into each episode at podcast.agencybud.com. Agency Bud is the platform that increases your revenue by providing software that you can on sell to your clients in a reseller model. Tap into agencybud.com and increase your bottom line. On the Agency Bud podcast, we talk to CEOs, founders, startups, anybody successful and amazing about the challenges they've overcome and the lessons they've learned along the way. Let's go and meet today's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me on the show. Today we have a special guest, somebody that literally has blown me away with the, with the depth of knowledge that they have in creating a story, creating a brand, and being able to take those brands to the marketplace in a meaningful way. And I use the word meaningful, not lightly. For the last couple of years, our special guest has been the managing partner of Meaningful LLC, which is a branding specialized company. Now, I wanna read off some of the companies that our special guest has worked with. He's worked in the finance space with people like American Express and Bank of America. He's worked in the food industry with McDonald's and Burger King. He's worked entertainment with Disney. He's worked with some of the biggest companies in the world like HP, like Volkswagen. He has been in the marketing and branding space for the better part of three decades. Let me pause. And it is an incredible pleasure and an honor to introduce Mr. Brian Kelly. Brian, thank you so much for joining us on the show. You're welcome. It's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic to have you with us, man. Now, you've, you've been telling the story of brands and helping them create a meaningful place in the marketplace for a while now. How did you get started into that space? Well, I think for me, right, I, was, I grew up, I, I was more of an artist and um, was attracted to beautiful design, beautiful things. Um, and as I started to look at what I would do for a vocation, um, I couldn't see myself drawing for other people. So I tried to figure out what to do. And I started, I kind of started to read books about advertising um, based on uh, great design and great layouts and great art direction. And I started to see an opportunity where um, I would not just create beautiful things, but I would actually have the control from authorship through production you know, control through through authorship and presentation through production and out into the market. Rather than just being an illustrator or a designer, I would kind of be uh, orchestrating over the whole lifeline of an idea. And that, that appealed to me. And so I, I got into advertising. And what, what I found is that even though I was a designer, art director, I loved to write. I loved words. I was very analytical. I was very strategic got very intrigued about human psychology, how people work, and, and always kind of had an anthropological lens uh, over any of the projects or brands that I worked on because that's really what gave it the weight and the gravity for me to really stay interested because otherwise you're just doing a, you're just doing a print ad for soap or lawn right. fertilizer. Like how do, you, how do you get your whole being into that? How do you become passionate and zealous for that Um, and it's really understanding what soap or lawn fertilizer mean to people, like what, what, what the meaning is in that product and in that brand. And, um, and, and as time has gone on, I really have come to realize that, that having an anthropological context for your brand is, is key to understanding why it matters, why it's important to people, you know, like right now today because of this pandemic, you see how that very specific context like puts, puts an entire new framework around things like financing, mm. you know, or um, uh, e-commerce, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I mean, those are always important, <clears throat> but they're important now in very specific ways because you understand the context in which you're operating. Right. The, and then the biggest context is not just the things that are happening in the moment in society, but also the context and how people are wired and how people work. Right. You know, how they operate, how they how they how they respond to things and at what level people respond. Uh, we were talking briefly about belief systems and belief systems. You know, all our behavior follows our belief. It's never not that way. Right. Behavior always, always follows belief. So the key for a marketer is what do people believe? Mm. What do they believe about your brand? What do they believe about you? 
what do they believe about themselves, right? And when you understand what people really believe, then when you speak to that, it awakens those beliefs. They, they're no longer emotional and unconscious, but they become conscious. I'm aware of it because you just said it to me in your messaging. And now I'm galvanized to that and I'm connected, right? So something powerful and deep has happened at that moment with the right messaging and the right execution, right? Do you think that brands succeed because they change people's beliefs or because they align with them? Second one, they align. Yeah, right. You, you don't change people's beliefs. Um, th there are moments where you do have to course correct, where people need, that they have a false belief about your brand. But I'm talking more about the beliefs that people have about life and about their dreams and about what they should expect from a car or a bank, right? And a lot of times those beliefs, while they're held, they're not conscious because mm. they're emotional. They're, they're liminal. They're, they're in, you know. And so um, you walk around building your life around your beliefs, many of which form when you're very young. I mean, yep. when a lot of the problems people have in life, the coping mechanisms, the addictions, are based on beliefs built around traumatic experiences, right? Like, like mm. being rejected in the playground, right? Having, yep. having your nose bloodied because, you know, the, 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 the volleyball hit you in the face right. and you're embarrassed, right? Wetting your pants, you know, um, somebody throws your shoe over the fence and you, you have to walk around all day with a, those are traumatic for a kid and you build, you build beliefs around that rules yeah, yeah. around that. Like I'm, I'm a loser. Nobody wants, you know, those kind of things, those are all negative and beliefs aren't all negative, but I'm just saying those are the kind of things you have to understand that that's at the core of the people we're marketing to. Mm. Right. Mm. So, so when you start working with a that. when you start working with a company, like I mean, whoever it is, whether it's in the finance space, the entertainment space, the the hospitality space, I mean, you've worked with all of these. You've worked with so many different types of industries across across the planet. When you start working with somebody, how do you how do you begin to break down the the position that that company has and align it with, as you were saying, the beliefs of their ideal customers? Well, it. It happens, I mean, I can speak for myself. I mean, it happens very quickly. And it's not like a lot of companies build their business, a lot of consultancies and, and, and branding companies build their business really around, you know, a six month timeline and, you know, six figures and a, and a huge publication of everything they found. But it, that's pedantic and that's exaggerated and that's a business model but it's hardly ever really necessary. What you really need is just a few days or weeks of clarity where you really start to see, and usually it happens very quick. Like we, we worked briefly with a bank in New York that um, so much of the financial industry has changed, right? Um, mm. in, in 96, when, when Treasury, or uh, yeah, Robert Rubin changed, they changed the banking rules and all of a sudden, uh, banks could uh, do business across states. And so all of a sudden you saw the merger craziness that happened with Wachovia and Wells Fargo. And uh, I, I had worked, uh, helped launch Bank One at a first USA with some guys in New York. We launched it. It was the fourth largest bank in the country on birth, right? Wow. It was huge. Yeah. Chase bought them, right? So Chase yeah. bought All that merger stuff was happening, right? <laughs> but um, um, this bank in New York um, they're a local bank, but they're a big local bank. And they have just been who they have been since day one, which was the Civil War, and mm. they haven't changed. Mm. They haven't grown through acquisition. They haven't done it. They're a local bank doing what they always did on day one, which was serve the immigrant working class community of Brooklyn. Yeah, right. And they're still doing it today. The only thing that's different, other than you know the people, <laughs> is um, the immigrants. They're no longer like Irish or Jewish or Syrian or Chinese. Now they're, um, you know, from the Middle East or they're from Africa or, you know, um, West, West Africa or something. And so that's the only thing that's different. But there's something great and noble and timeless about what they're doing. Right. Yeah. And so um, you take that which is very cool and very, very pure. It's very true to who they are. So you, you right away you can see. And this is like in, in 
moments, not months, you see that they, that they have a, a DNA that they're still true to. So mm. that's gold. You know you're going to work with that. And then you also look anthropologically, like what, what's happening, right? Well, so 35, and I'm, I know it's closer to 40 now because of the pandemic, but 35% of every working American is self-employed. Wow. And that number is growing 2 to 3% a year, mm-hmm. right? So, and that, that's, um, so, so part of what this bank was doing was um, they wanted to target uh, small business. And we said, that's all you need to do is target small business because a third of consumer banking are also small business people. And small business is the, the heroic archetype now for the new world, right? The way the nature of work has changed, the gig economy is not a thing. The gig economy is just the first realization of the nature of work that is forever changed, mm-hmm. right? Um, so we, we, we tried to get them to understand, just go after small business, right? And that as a bank, you're still doing what you always did. You believe in what you're doing. You believe in small business. You believe in the small guy. You believe in the working, right? So all these things, you believe in waking up at 4.15 a.m. You believe, you know, in um, uh, family recipes. You believe, you know, you, you have all these same beliefs that the small business people have. Therefore, and then the tagline was a bank you can believe in. Nice. Beautiful. So that that all happened almost as quickly as I'm telling you it. You see it very quickly. Now the key, can you get the bank to buy it? Right. Because all the bank wants to do is deposit accounts. Yeah, right. Sure. They want to talk about interest rates. They want to talk about, you know, protection of the money. And that's not what the, the customer is buying. That's not what they're buying. That's at some point you have to do business on that level, but that's not that's not your that's not your marketing. That's not but, your branding. Before we started, we were having a great conversation and yeah. actually I love what you, what you said and, and just to bring our listeners up to speed, we talked about um, back in 2006, I think you mentioned, that you had an yeah. epiphany where it, it went from being uh, that companies had a product to sell. Hey, I've got a XYZ widget, whether that's a bank account or it's a vehicle, right. I've got a widget and you should buy it because it's great and you know, if you buy it, you'll be great. And it's, and it's completely flipped to now this, this uh, concentration on a humanitarian belief as in a, an alignment of values and the product almost becomes a medium as in if you get them the, the, the branding right, let's, let's use that word. If you get the story right, then the product becomes a, almost not irrelevant, but it almost becomes a, a second, second string to the, the uh, connection with the humanity. Yeah, I mean, the, product, the product's always important but the product, if the product is a medium for the belief, then that product is not sacrosanct. Another, another product or an extension of that line or, or going into another uh, line of business altogether can, can start to further that same, that same idea, right? Mm-hmm. We, talked about, we talked about Zipcar really standing for um, access yeah. over ownership. And that wasn't quite understood in 2006 as much as it might be today because you've got things like Spotify, which is access over ownership. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and you have an entire like rental economy now that like millennials are driving, which is they, they don't want to get into hock. They've seen their boomer parents. Hello. (laughs) They've seen them (laughs) with the two houses and the two cars and the two mortgages and the, you know, college, yeah. you know, financing, they've seen that and they're like, I don't, I don't want to get sucked into that. And so they're playing it loose. They're playing it very loose and they're yeah. happy renting and just having access over ownership. Now that's a, that's a generational shift. That's an mm-hmm. anthropological shift. Mm-hmm. And so you can't just do business as usual and not expect to miss something along the way when, when reality is shifting around you, you have to be aware of that. That's, so you, as a, as a marketer, you have to have that anthropological lens to really understand what's happening. And, and, and I think the brands that lose relevancy are the brands that lose their context. They, they forget why they matter. Right. They, con- they concentrate more on the, the sale of the product rather than the, the meaning behind what, what, what their place in the market is. Yeah. I mean, if you go back, I mean, uh, 
I, you know, one of the great, two of the great positionings, I mean, there's a bunch, but two that I always pull up um, is, is obviously, um, well, I shouldn't say obviously, Apple, when they did the computer for the rest of us. Mm. That was going back when they launched the Mac. And uh, that, that in one short colloquial statement uh, adjusted, made, made the whole landscape binary, right? It was either, it was either A or B. A or B, right? And that eventually became Mac or PC. But the point was, if you're not a computer person, what do you do? Right. And so much of the world is not a computer person. And right. so this is the computer for the rest of us, right? The yeah. rest of us being the majority. That was brilliant. Same thing Volkswagen did with Drivers Wanted, right? In the world of life, or in, in the road of life, uh, there's passengers and there's drivers. And then they just said drivers wanted. I love well, who that. wants to be a passenger when you put it that way. But Absolutely. you start to see that it's 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 a self-defining uh, message where you know you want to be a driver. So then how do you how do you how does your product deliver on that? Mm. And it doesn't just have to be a car because you now stand for something bigger. And the car, while it can be beautiful and exciting and expensive and and necessary. It's just a medium for that idea. The idea is I want to be in the driver's seat. I love it. So what do you, what do you stand for? What does your product stand for? What do you, what, what yeah. would your customers um, ultimately be feeling as they took ownership of that product? What do you want them to experience? And that can be the, yeah. the, the underlying message. Brian, when you started, you, you were talking about uh, wanting to create beautiful things and, and wanting to be the director of the story all the way from inception to marketplace. Do you remember the first yeah. time? Do you remember the first account <laughs> that you took from concept to marketplace and had the kind of success that, that you'd hoped it had and, and the result of that? Tell me about that. I'm, 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 I'm tempted to tell you a funny story. I'd love that. Um, Go with that. Well, I, okay. So i literally, it's the first project. Um, so I started my career in Chicago and I was in the bullpen, which, which for anybody born, you know, after, you know, 1980, um, they wouldn't know what a bullpen is, but that, <laughs> that was where that was, that was the room that was full of uh, spray mountain cut paper and razor blades and, and tracing uh, machines. And you had to put stuff together and there was something called uh press type letter set press type where um, people would, grab them and use all of one vowel and you'd have 30 sheets missing all the letter E's and you couldn't <laughs> press down the type and do your design. So I'm a kid out of college and I'm, uh, I'm working in the bullpen at a Chicago agency of, you know, global BBDO. And, um, I take control of the bullpen and I, I inventory all that stuff. And I'm, so I'm doing all these things and reorganizing that place and making it work better and ordering and making sure that if somebody needs the letter E and Franklin Gothic, they got it, you know? Right. Right. And so people love that. They thought I was great. And they, uh, they gave me a shot at, at working on my first print ad, which was uh, Jim beam, the, 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 the liquor company. And they had these things that are very, very popular. They're called um, decanters, right? Yep. And so Jim Beam, they keep coming out with these decanters. And this one was for Ducks Unlimited, which is a big group of you know guys that love birds and ducks and love hunting. Huge following, huge, huge population. And so they had a Ducks Unlimited decanter um, that had uh, two ducks. And one of them was taking off flying and it had a ceramic base. And I thought, oh. I know what I'm going to do. And so I'm not even thinking of the message. I'm thinking of the photo, right? And so I orchestrate this photography. We, we build with a photographer. We build this uh, um, huge flat table, fill it with water, have reeds and all this. And we set this thing in. It's almost, it's almost like magical. It came to life in its environment and all that. And um, we shot the photograph and we, you know, shot it all day, a million exposures. And then I look and I get it retouched and all that. And I do the layout and I wasn't really paying attention. Somebody that I had not worked with uh, sent in the headline and the headline said, this is your lucky duck, which didn't make any sense to me until I put it with the picture 
and it looked like the duck who was flying was humping the duck who wasn't flying. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. First love it. And did it yeah. fly? Like, did it, did it go well for Jim Beam? Like, did they, did they accept it and like it or was it? Uh, I, you know, I held my breath and nobody called me on it, but that's all I could ever see anytime I looked at it. <laughs> it was, it was a silly, it was a silly ad. It was important because it was my first one. So right? Brian I, Kelly's I, tagline I, now is we help you get lucky. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I love it. That's very cool. Yeah. And have you seen, so now in the digital age, Brian, I mean, I, I'm looking at a, a beautiful Mac behind you. I'm talking to you on a Mac right now as well. And, you know, we're talking about computers and, and the advancement of technology. Now in the digital age, are you seeing a very different uh, creative concept to, to production um, realm. Like, you yeah. know, you've gone from that amazing photo, sh photo shoot and, you know, setting everything out and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Does that still happen or is it just, you know, is it all done via tech these days? Yeah, it's, it's, it's changed a lot. And, you know, we, you, you could lament uh, how it's changed, but it, it's not going to, it's not going to make anything better or make you any happier. You just have to go with it. I think, um, what was clear early on is that the the functionality of the the um, you know kind of like wireframes, like the the way the design and the publishing first you know it was Quark and then and then InDesign, the way the way those um, applications operated with boxes and everything like a wireframe that that totally changed the way art directors and designers worked. I mm. mean, they started to they started to think they were more affected by the, by the technology than the technology was affected by them. Right. You know? sure. And, and then I think on top of that, the, the natural desire that a creative has to see their ideas produced, mm. uh, basically drew everybody to, to the machine to make things look finished and final and done. Right. Mm. And so, uh, the, the idea that you would, you know, you would pick up two pieces of paper and put them together and go, you know, I kind of like, I kind of like the way that goes off the page and, you know, and, and which is exactly what happened to me. I remember being in Amirati in New York and I'm in, um, their bullpen. They still had one at that time. And I saw a cut out piece of paper that had type and some of the type was, had been cut off. So the type was literally too big for the square. And I love the way that looked. And we were doing a campaign for Condé Nast and they, I thought they're too big for the page. They're too big for traditional magazines. Right. And so I literally used that idea that I found and did, we did spread ads where there was one of their beautiful photos, whether it was Irving Penn or Annie Leibovitz or something. And then on the other side was this type that was cropped off the page a little bit, like too big. And Cy Newhouse looks at it and he goes, the type is going off the page. <laughs> and I said, yeah. Yeah, that's my point. Too I said, you're too big for a conventional magazine. And he kind of sat back, smiled a little bit, looked at it and didn't say anything. Nice, you got it through. I like it. Very cool. Do you know, um, Brian, as I, I looked, I was you know, doing the research before we started the show and, and uh, Volkswagen caught my eye because I've, I've got a pair of them sitting outside in my, in my driveway. I'm working with Volkswagen and clicking on your brand clicking on your story from your from your website and then going into you know what you did with with volkswagen i was i was captured by how many different bus billboards and and billboards in subways and you know all of these amazing billboards that were part of volkswagen's campaign and of course the um the, the actual advertising tv campaign and the the digital media that went with that as well now volkswagen's a, a massively big company and, and we talk about yeah. um brand awareness you know telling that story from a brand yeah. awareness point of view is that kind of uh, let me let me phrase this question the right way. When I talk to business owners uh, and we talk about different types of marketing, we can go with either brand awareness campaigns or we can go with direct response campaigns. Is the brand awareness um, and the direct response alpha and beta, are they polar opposites? Can they be merged? Oh. Is, is, the, yeah. is the branding functionality and, and awareness of, of a Jim Beam or a Volkswagen available to the little guy? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the mistake that a lot of people make is they see them as uh, it's, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it's like science and God, like they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And it's the same thing with branding and anything tactical or direct response. They should work together. I mean, in the end, 
a good idea, even at a brand level, a good idea should drive right down to the ground and go, this is how we need to do it. Like, for example, we didn't produce it, but when I was working uh, Scott's Miracle Grow, big company, right? I mean, they got 70 plus percent of the, of the, of the home and garden market mm-hmm. because they essentially really got in bed with the big box stores and rode that growth, the, yeah. you're right, the Home Depot and Lowe's, Walmarts. And so it, it was smart and they got a smart, smart CEO. Um, they, they've never really embraced what makes a lawn so important. Right. right? It, they're, they're, they're kind of stuck a little bit in an old uh, mentality about it. it's green grass and uh, no, it's, 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 it's life. It's part of your living space, yeah. you know? But, um, and it's also, well, I, I won't get into it, but <laughs> the, um, so, so they've, they've got this amazing product, right? Miracle Grow, which is kind of, it's odd to the younger generation because it's kind of like something from like, like the, like the George Jetsons, like yeah, it's right. this blue crystals, you know, I want organic. What is this stuff? And the funny thing is it's stuff you can find in your kitchen sink. It's stuff that you would spray if you made a homemade fertilizer. It's thing, it's, it's good things that help the plant. It just comes in a George Jetson kind of package. Pers- right. I mean the name miracle grow with a yeah, W yeah. missing. It's just hokey, you know, but there's so much equity, they're not going to change it. So one of the things, so we were trying to figure out a whole bunch of ways to make this brand relevant to the emerging you know, generation of, of homeowners and gardeners. And one of the ways, and we had like four or five ideas at play at the same time, but one of the ways was um, kind of taking a card from uh, the Volkswagen, right? Drivers Wanted is like, reshaping the landscape into a binary one. And so the strategic position was people who grow things are different than people who don't. And that's based on a very simple scientific truth that is people who are outdoors gardening, largely because of the serotonin in the soil, they sleep better, they're more creative, they're more optimistic, they're happier, they're more alert, they're more, I think I said collaborative, Um, they, they problem solve better. And so all these things that um, grow in you when you're growing things, right? And you can extrapolate that to maybe you smile more, maybe your smile is 13% bigger, maybe you open a door, you're more likely to open a door for someone else. Whatever these nice, um, uh, um, the nice fruit, not not to Mm -hmm. do a pun, but the fruit of those things, right? So we said, how cool would that be to have young people who aren't really kind of in this, in this franchise, have them go down with little miracle grow gardening kits to Washington, DC and intercept the con- congressional people down there, give them a little gardening thing so they could like fucking work better and wow. more collaboratively. Cool. Right? So, so that's, that's like gorilla. That's as, as to the ground as you can get, but it yeah. comes from a very high level idea. Wow, cool. So it's taking that, that massive brand, that international, um, yes. as you said, the equity in, in behind something that's so tried and true and, and then making it really granular in terms of touch, feel, right, like yeah, right onto the ground. Incredible. So but a good idea should do that. A good idea should, should get down to the ground like so fast. You got to keep up with it, man. It's like walking a fast dog. You know, Amazing. the idea should just come and, dr- and you go, wow, we got to do this. Is that, that's a great segue because what happens once a brand's established their story, they've established their position. We talked about that bank that's a, you know, specifically driven towards a particular sector. They've, they've um, created that. They've crafted that image. Mm-hmm. What happens then? How do they continue to keep that, that story relevant as, as the landscape changes, as the world changes? What do they have to do on a continual basis? Well, it's a, it's a, it, that's a, a tricky question because it, it is what you brought up. It's the change around you that drives and necessitates, not that you change your story, but your story has to continually be relevant, which means you have to continually be examining why you matter, mm. right? Because things are changing around you. So why did, so, and, and, and I think a brand there is, there is a degree of social consciousness or relevance that, that a brand wants to have. I remember going way back. 
I know it was in the 90s, even might have been before that. In England, uh, there was a place called uh, St. Luke's, which was uh, a kind of an iconoclastic upstart little place. But they, they had a thing called Total Role in Society, um, TRS, that they would talk to brands about. You, you have to have a role, a, a societal role for you to truly be a brand because people are looking. And you know what that was? It was a precursor to Simon Sinek's why. Not that he invented that. He just popularized it. So it kind of accrued to him. Hmm. But I know since the late eighties, I've been saying to clients and, and to deadpan stares, unfortunately, is like (laughs) more important (laughs) than what you're doing. Why you're doing it. I know people want to know why they want to know why you're doing, why you're selling what you're selling and why you sell it the way you sell it. Hmm. That's what people that's what people need to understand so they know where to file you in, in, their, in their mind. Like, what do, you, what do you stand for? What's important? What drives you? What's your why, right? And Total Role for Society was a precursor to that, really. And, and meaningful is, is, it's the same thing. I mean, everybody's going after the same thing from different directions with different nomenclature, but it's, it's the same thing because it's always that. It's always been that and always yeah. will be that. Tell me about the creation of Meaningful. So this is a, a couple of years into this project right now. So you're managing partner of, of Meaningful LLC, which is, uh, let me get yeah. the website right, meaningful.co. Uh, sorry, be meaningful.co. And people can yeah. come there and, and find out all about what you're doing. Yeah. Which, um, yeah. I think you're going to find some, some people very interested to do so after this. Um, so be meaningful.co. How did that, how did that uh, group of partners come together? How did you start to form the, the concept behind that? Well, you know, what happens is you, you, because I mentioned earlier, right, the nature of work chain has changed and it's become, especially in, in advertising and marketing, it's become a gig economy. And they're, they're just, there's not a lot of, especially at a, at a higher income, there's not a lot of staff. And so there's a lot of people being brought in on projects. I mean, I mean, I've worked directly with clients. I've also worked with a lot of agencies. I mean, I've, I've done the work that an agency takes credit for in front of a client. And it yep. was me, not them, <laughs> me, you know, and I want to right? go to the clients. I want to go to the client's house in a weekend, ring the doorbell and go, Hey, that was that me. Was me. <laughs> but so, um, so when I, when I came up here uh, to Portland, which is another story, I came up, which was not my playbook. I came up to Portland because I had an opportunity to, to and I always, I always wanted to see what it'd be like to run a brand from the corporate side, mm-hmm. to actually have the keys to the car, right? Not just be somebody who wanted to drive the car, but I actually mm-hmm. owned the car. And I thought that would be really cool. Um, and so I did that. Uh, so it got me up here to Portland and in a couple of industry meetings, I bumped into this young guy who we hit it off. Um, he was an old soul. He was interested in things that I said, which predated him and, and we'd have coffee and talk about things. I ended up helping him and his agency, um, on some projects, um, which is how, how we ended up, um, connecting initially with this data center company Mm. and, um, did some positioning for them. And, uh, he and I hit it off and, and he was like, like I said, he was an old soul, but he was young. He, he can do things digitally that I don't know how to do. Like technically he'll, he'll just do stuff. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> I got, I got to keep you around. You're, you're handy. Nice. Um, and then, so that, that's bogey. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's American, but he came over really young to this country from the Ukraine. So his, he's Russian descent. And then, um, and then Q I just got odd people with odd names. And so Q <laughs> just makes the business cards um, easy to print. Yeah. Who, who's <laughs> actually, uh, um, he goes by Q like James Bond, but, it, but his name is actually Q Mars and he's, he's of um, Persian descent and by way of South Africa and Sweden to Minneapolis, LA. And then him and I were working together, uh, multiple times in San Diego. Um, we just, we're just really like each other. We really get along. Um, we're passionate about what we do. And, and, um, we, we, we talked about it a year and a half ago. We talked about, um, just doing something for ourselves. Cause I think we were getting fed up with collaborating with other agencies mm. and working for them or through them for a client because they don't always go to the wall. Like they're not, they, they're agencies 
are always trying to figure out what a client wants, what's sellable, what we can do, what's going to keep the business. There, there's all this manipulation and jockeying and second guessing. And it's, it just, it's just horrible, you know? Mm -hmm. And for, for me, a good day is where you just put it all out there and you're honest and transparent and you said your thing. And if the client doesn't buy it, then you're okay with it because you basically told them what you thought yeah. the right thing to do was. But if you hold back and then they don't do it, it just gnaws away at you. Like a decade later, you keep thinking like, man, if I we had we, just, yeah. you know, and I, I have a story. I, I did that in 2006. A lot happened back then. 2006, <laughs> I did that for Union Pacific. I was working with a, a brand identity company who had years ago stopped doing the, the messaging part of their business and they were just doing brand identity naming and consulting but they had great relationships with fortune 100 companies and they thought wow um we hit it off when we met the two partners and myself and they thought you know we could expand into the agency business with our existing clients if 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 we had someone like you and we could do that and so we had like a two and a half hour meeting and by the time I got home 30 minutes later, they had two projects wow. from clients. Wow. And one of them was Union Pacific, which um, was doing a nostalgic, beautiful black and white landscape nostalgic campaign about the railroad. But that wasn't going to do anything for their business. That was just them talking to themselves, feeling good about who they were. But there was no business aspect to that. And they knew it. And so they said, uh, here's two issues that we're facing. We're not sexy on Wall Street, right? All they want is like Cisco and all that, pure plays, right? And we're just an old, like, railroad. Right. We're essential. If you didn't have us, you'd be crying like a baby, but we're not sexy. Mm -hmm. And we, we recruiting, we can't get top talent because we're not sexy. So it's sexy was just the main issue. Yeah. And I'm using the word sexy. They didn't. Um, so, so in two days, kind of came up with this whole approach for their brand, which is they had, they had a $12 million print campaign that they had already earmarked for two years doing this beautiful uh, campaign. And their tagline was building America, which was, uh, written kind of as a response to 9-11. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a you know pep rally, like we can do this and we're mm -hmm. building America. You know, but it, the, the truth of it is they literally, the railroads literally built this country, mm -hmm. you know? So it was, a, it was a truer than true statement. And I thought, well, all right, they're not going to open a new marketing front with a new tagline or a new messaging. So what can I do with building America? I said, well, this is it. I've always loved Tocqueville. Alexander Tocqueville, who came to this country and called us the American experiment, which would be beautiful if any presidential candidate would use that today, but it ain't going to happen. <laughs> but, and so I thought, what if it wasn't the diesel and steel that, that built America, but what if it was the ideas and the people that built America, which is a continuing experiment. Now you have, and, and who better to, 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 to bring that uh, concept forward than a railroad. Like Pepsi talking about building America wouldn't make any sense. No, absolutely. Right? Yeah. But the railroad talking about building America. And so the idea was um, they had 300,000 rail cars. They said, we own a third of them. So they have 100,000 rail cars. And the, the idea was to have portraits kind of before Gap was doing it, but have portraits of famous people who you might or might not know. It could be, it could be like uh, Dizzy Gillespie or something, and it could be Bill Gates, but it could also be a school teacher in Seattle. It could be uh, like the, the, the little girl in Afghanistan that got the acid thrown her. Some people know who she is, some don't, right? So all levels of notoriety, some alive, some dead, right? Um, I mean, it could be like Tesla or Edison, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, their portrait in black and white on the side of these rail cars with building America. And that's all it was. And then you get this brilliant uh, European landscape photographer, Jan Staller, who does these beautiful empty nocturnal industrial landscapes, get him to photograph 
these rail cars all around the country at traveling exhibitions, photograph exhibition of coffee table book in key cities. By then, your two years is, is run by, and that same 12 million, instead of going into a, a sleepy print campaign, goes into original content on NPR, something called Building America. Yeah. Brought to you by Union Pacific, right? And so, and each episode would be quarterly, and each episode talks about science, education, you know, whatever. Nice. And so, you yeah. pick the big things that we're trying to puzzle through and continue to move, you know, to invent and move forward on. And so, they they move from being a diesel and steel vendor to be a thought leader. That's so cool, right? The problem is, the company I was working for didn't present the whole idea. They just presented up to the rail cars to which they're like, well, yeah. what if somebody vandalizes them? Yeah. What if they're all in one place and not in everywhere? You know, so they, they held they just, back. They held back on, you know, yeah, on the yeah, delivery. Yeah. But, but, but the, the, the whole point of that story is you, you've got to play it all the way out and you just have to throw caution to the wind and saying, look, I'm not, I'm not browbeating you. This is passion. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just. I think if you did this all the way, it would be magnificent. I can't convince you of that. I can only try. Yeah, perfect. And and that's that's your uh, your philosophy now behind meaningful. Like you and the partners sitting down with a company and playing yeah. all out. And you know, yeah. going back on your experience, Brian. So you can literally you, you can sit in front of a company, a, a client, and you can say whether you do this or don't is up to you. But this is what I believe everything on the table is going to be your best story moving forward. And you've been able to create that with meaningful and with the partners and, 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 uh, and do that successfully. You can sleep better at night, I guess, with the, the knowledge yeah. that, that your ideas have been presented without anything held back. Yeah. And the key, the key is going to be, uh, you know, you need a Medici, you need a patron of the arts. You need somebody who, who believes there's value in what you, you know, I want to paint this, you know, somebody has to bankroll that yeah, somebody yeah. has to fund that. And so a client, I, I, I keep, I keep using the word Medici. You need somebody who wants to be famous, who wants to be meaningful, who wants to make impact, you know, and, and there are a lot of people, the majority of people aren't, don't, they think small, the, the tyranny of the urgent, they're scared of their own shadow. They just don't want to, you know, they want to spend their marketing budgets and not screw up, you know, and they're just going to do the, the inbound, the funnel campaigns, the, mm. the drip, drip, drip. That's what they're going to do, you know. So have you found it difficult to, to attract those clients that have that shared vision? I mean, are you, are you guys busy? Are you, are, you, are you booked out for the next six months or are you? No, you know, no, no, no. You're looking for those. No, we're not. No, we're not busy. We're still. We're still. We're. We're still trying to pull in our our charter clients, and mm -hmm. um, it's. I don't. I thought you know, like anybody, I think we probably imagined we get a little more immediate traction. It's been a little quieter and slower mm -hmm. than we would like, but we're not. We're not going to freak, and and we are doing other projects. All of us are doing sure. other projects. Sure. I mean, I'm I'm up to my eyeballs and things that. Um, but I, I want to stop doing those so I can just work with our clients. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. But, but those clients have to be the right clients, you know, and, and I'm not, it's not like, it's not like we're pushing people away. I don't mean to sound like that. We're just, you, you, it's important where you start because w most companies, most brands, even in their, in their marketing, you get, once, once you get established, you get to pivot one foot. You don't get to move both. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And so that first, those charter clients put that first foot down and that's mm -hmm. where you're going to be. And if you're, if you're working for, <clears throat> um, and again, I, I'm not against metrics, but if you're, if you're just working with a metrics driven client, who's doing a sales funnel thing and it's, it's a sales culture, which never has a finish line because once you hit your projection, then there's another there's yeah, another line out there you got to yeah, get. Yeah. And so it's just this, this endless, you know, keep moving the finish line, keep moving it out. Um, and I've worked, that's where I came up to Portland. I work for a company like that. Um, you're probably not going to do great work. You're going to make a positive impact, but it's going to be incremental. Yeah. Um, when I came up here in Portland, uh, the, the corporate job was for a, a SaaS company, software and services company in the healthcare space. Now, 
Now, to somebody who's worked in a whole bunch of things from like, you know, burgers, to cars, to airplanes, to banks, s- software, sorry. No, that's <laughs> all right. Like, ah. And yeah. then software and healthcare even more. It was like, yeah. oh, man, I don't know if I can survive <laughs> that, right? Yeah, you got to need diet of that. need a lot of caffeine I'm, I'm just a, to I'm sit I'm like a it. chameleon, right? I, I yeah. live off of the variety. And um, so, uh, but, but there was a great CEO who wanted, he had a huge goal. And he was going to use uh, the, the, the healthcare niche we were in, the segment was physical therapy. And because healthcare was now driven by Medicare, was now um, measuring performance and paying like value based healthcare. So you were getting paid and compensated based on your metrics, right? Mm-hmm. That was playing right into the hands of physical therapy and sounding off alarm bells for a lot of traditional invasive procedures like mm-hmm. I mean first of all lower back pain is a bigger healthcare expense than cancer wow Jeez. and um and again you got to look at what's happening right and you've got baby boomers which is the largest population bubble in the history of the globe right and they're getting in an age where the lower back pain is causing hip and hip and knee replacement, which is the most prolific replacement, their surgery right now. So that's why healthcare is doing the bundled payments on that and and the and the value based care, trying to control because people are like popping you know, like like knees and hips like candy and stuff. Mm-hmm. And and if you look at to, there's a st- statistic that nobody's really looking at is right now with adolescents, we're talking like adolescents today they have in their population, they have a higher incidence of lower back pain than baby boomers. Oh, wow. And that's largely because of tech neck, because of yeah, sure. you know, the phone mm-hmm. and, and technology. So all of this is playing into like the healthcare system is gonna, gonna, gonna crash under its own weight mm-hmm. if it doesn't change. But it's hard to change a big thing. So the, the CEO said, we're gonna change healthcare by moving physical therapy into a first choice because it has better efficacy, it's lower cost, you can get eight visits at a physical therapist for the cost of one MRI and probably avoid the expensive and very ineffective back surgery, right? And so all of that is going to start to change healthcare and make it work better. And then he had a model where all the pr- private practitioners that were in our client base, we would create a national de facto network, you know, so it becomes an enterprise, not a private practice. So they don't have to go under a Providence or Scripps or Legacy Health. They can stay independent in our network. This is a beautiful idea. And um, he just ran too hard, too fast, locked horns with the investors, and he was gone. So, wow. But that's why I came, I came up there yeah. to create a brand, a brand positioning for this software. For, for a big change. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Wow. And, and then uh, moving into many Um. So we, we were talking about, uh, you know, moving now and attracting the right clients. And it would be remiss of me, I think, not to timestamp our, our, our episode, but not to talk about the pandemic and where we're at. Have you found yeah. that the, the changes over the last few months have had a massive impact on your client acquisition and the way you're doing the story? Or has it, you know, we were talking before we, we clicked record, this has been business as usual for, for us working from home. But what about your clients? Have you found that the growth of Meaningful has, has hit any bumps in these last few months? Well, yeah, yeah, it's it's hit bumps. It's it's kind of at a it's kind of static only because um, there there is a timeline for winning the affection and the trust of of somebody at a C suite level. Like mm-hmm. um, we're not really we're not really trying to get an audience with product managers or even CMOS unless they appear to be uh, charismatic CMOS. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we're really trying to talk to founders, um, CEOs, and and uh, venture capital people that have stakes and and realize that um, one of the quickest ways to one of the quick one of the best ROI um, on a on a on a property that you buy into is uh, branding. Yeah, branding it. I mean, you yeah. can increase the value. Of, of, of a company 20% with just a good branding campaign, which is relatively super low cost compared to a lot of infrastructure and distribution and supply chain things. Mm, mm, absolutely. You know, that, that can impact. So you can actually take 
whatever it was that attracted the venture capitalists, you can see what they see. You can begin to shape that vision and communicate it. And that brand will immediately be injected with that value yep. in people's eyes if you do it right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that can be done immediately and now, especially while people are in a different it, space and a different frame uh, you know, of working environments. And um, yeah, it, it, the it, equity. It, it seems, I think, what we, I think what we found is it seems like a lot of, I mean, one of the ways you have to do this, see, see one of the big issues that you, when you knock on somebody's door unsolicited, um, anybody in a company knows you don't take the call, open the email, download the attachment because you're liable for IP, for theft, right? We've even written a short or are writing a very short thing that says, you are indemnified of any liability for any, everything. We, we claim no ownership on anything we discuss. <laughs> it's just, we'll just do that. Wow. It's yours. You, something you hear you like, it's yours. Yeah, Our yeah. bad, <laughs> you know? We're not, gonna, we're not gonna play that game, you know, because we wanna have an audience. We wanna have a conversation, yeah. you know? And that's we believe we have value. And if, and if we can talk to somebody, we believe they'll see the value. And if they don't, then that's self-selecting. But I think it's made it very hard. And a lot of people, you know, that everybody's on LinkedIn now because that's kind of the go-to channel during the pandemic. But it's become so clogged with self-promotion and, and you know, uh, inflated content and everything that I think, I think there's, there's a fatigue. And so I think it's, it's hard to really get through to people on LinkedIn. A lot of people just, they're busy, don't go to their LinkedIn. A lot of CEOs don't go to LinkedIn. Yeah. You know, yeah. but there are a few that are doing great. There's a, there's a couple, there's one in particular that I, I admire his persona, his digital, his digital brand is fantastic right now. Mm. Oh, I think that's um, uh, going to be a skill set that a lot of people are, are bringing forward. So Brian, what's, uh, what's next for you? Like what's your next sort of six, 12 months got in store? What's the next five years got in store for, for you personally, for oh, meaningful? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. oh i you know i i think uh we're we're modest in that we want uh, a handful you know five four five six uh Mm -hmm. clients that have something of substance and we have a good relationship and we're able to do the kind of messaging that you know satisfies the art director in me satisfies the writer in me satisfies the anthropologist in me satisfies you know, the business person in me, um, and not just me, them too, you know, Q and, and bogey, but, um, you can make a good living. I think, um, staying fairly small and, and just not outgrowing your size. And Mm -hmm. I think for us, it's about quality over quantity. Um, and so, and so if, if we can get that, those charter clients, that base, I think we'll be pretty happy. And often I think when you're good at what you do and you have good relationships, um, you find more people want you. And then you got to, then you got to confront that problem. Like I didn't want to be this big. And I think that would be a great problem. Not the one, but you know what, if we're big, the one thing I've always loved to do, always wanted to do, never did enough of is, is really bring great talent in on projects. Mm. I mean, just, Oh my God, there's so much great talent out there that's floating around. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I think what, what it, there's great talent everywhere, but I'm talking about people that know how to do big scale things and get it done. Uh, we, we can bring in big agency talent without the big agency price tag, you know? And I think there's, there's very few agencies that are small that can do that. There's some really good small agencies, mm. but they're small. Yeah. They're small in experience. They're small in talent, you know. Um, and then the ones that have some of the some of the greatest talent and have the chops and have the production abilities, they're big. Yeah. You know. I mean, Droga was bought, you know, for a reason. I mean, he's good, right, at what he yeah. does. He yeah. thinks the way I like to think. I think, you know. Nice. Um, well, I'm excited so, for you, man. So, think, yeah. 
I think the way that, that uh, you know, just even during this last hour or so together, talking about finding the meaning behind why a company exists and, and having that passion to be able to lay that story out and, uh, you know, put everything on the line and say, this is how the brand can impact and, and be perceived. I think that's going to be exciting for you, man. I'm, 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 I would love to follow, you know, the story of Be Meaningful and, and see who comes on board with you and how the work that you do with them changes their companies and brands and, and moving that forward. I noticed that you're, you're not a big tweeter. You, you've got a, a, a bit of a um, LinkedIn following, but how can people follow along with you and with Be Meaningful? Uh, I know that you've got the podcast coming through, which I think, by the way, just as a tiny little side note, Brian yeah. and the Be Meaningful podcast are, are, are taking companies and their stories and helping them pull apart their meaning and their brand story live on a podcast. Guys, if, you, if, that's, if that's an incredible thing for you, looking as a business and wanting to understand how you can craft your story, the, the Be Meaningful podcast with Brian and, and the crew there is something that you should really engage with. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm excited as how that plays out, man. How can people best follow you along? Uh, it, it really is. It really is LinkedIn and Medium. Um, we we need to ramp up some of our content. Uh, uh, no surprise, being being a creative and overly thoughtful person, I have so many unfinished articles. Um, <laughs> I have one about creativity explained, um, where I take a very clinical view of creativity, which is is not expected from a creative person myself, but it's important because it talks about making connections. Um, uh, I can see this as I can see this as a hardcover book. This is a, a you know the unfinished unfinished creativity by Brian Kelly. Oh and just like let yeah, people yeah, let people memoirs. write their own yeah, conclusions. That's the unfinished book. The only yeah, my memoirs. <laughs> that's nice. Let let people decide their own ending. Yeah. So really, it's it's medium and LinkedIn, and cool. uh, I I need to do more of this. I I love I love chatting. I love talking to people. It's been fun talking to you and. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot inside, you know, that just, if, if it has to be written and crafted and proofread, it's never going to get out because I'm yep. just too busy or I, I have new thoughts, push it out of the way. So to be able to sit down and just kind of like share in real time is, is a gift. It's great. Fantastic. And, and the podcast goes a long way with that as well. Well, there's no doubt in, in my mind that your passion for, for branding and your passion for creating meaning behind brand, more important than the, the logo or the, the tagline, that is 100% clear. So I, I have no doubt that those charter clients are going to be stamping on, on your door without, without too much more time passing. Yeah. Um, Brian, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to come and bounce back and forth yeah. with you. I've, I've loved it. Um, I, I can certainly feel... Uh, on a personal level, I can feel myself looking at my own company, my own branding, and now going back and, and asking that question, why are we meaningful? What is our purpose? I can understand that from my own personal, and I hope that any businesses listening have that same thought pattern. They can look at what they've got out there and, and try and um, craft the story that will hold their place for a long time coming. So I thank you for that. Yeah. And uh, cool. above all else, man, I just wish you and the team a meaningful, uh, a great success moving forward. And, you know, as we said before we clicked on record, a life filled with kids and dogs, what could be better? Not much, not much. Absolutely. We're going to go figure out dinner now. We're going to cook. Nice. That's awesome, man. Side of the globe. Perfect, mate. And, and again, thank you so much for the story behind uh, Be Meaningful. So that's BeMeaningful.co. And uh, keep in touch with Brian across Medium and across LinkedIn. And again, mate, thank you so much for the time. Yeah, thank you, Walter. It was great. Appreciate it.